everyone, and welcome to another Tabletop Gaming Lecture. I am Jason Bullman, the Director of Game Design at Paizo, and the creator of the Pathfinder role-playing game. And today, I'd like to talk to all of you about making the most out of your monsters. Um, you know, I've been thinking about doing this particular lecture for a while. Monsters are a critical tool in the GM's toolkit. Um, you know, uh, the villains, the NPCs, they're all equally important, but without monsters, um, your, your story, your world isn't going to have the right texture that it needs. Monsters are kind of the filler. They're the background. They're the baseline from which everything else kind of springs. So, you know, um, not everything the players face can be a villain. Monsters have to be the baseline conflict of your story. They are the, the simplest challenge. They're the things that the players are always expecting to run into. There's always going to be more monsters. Um, so in that, they, they kind of make up the meat of the story. They are the kind of most basic expected op obstacles that the players are, are looking for in an adventure. And uh, I honestly think that as GM, playing off that expectation, knowing when to use it and when to subvert it, is kind of one of the most useful tricks you can master as, as a game master. So let's get uh, jump right into this. And we're going to start out with uh, the first topic that I want to talk about, which is just planning fights. The way we're going to do this, I'm going to talk about planning fights. Then I'm going to talk about picking the right monster. And then at the end, I'm going to uh, go ahead and talk about how to build new monsters uh, from scratch. Um, we're not going to be focusing too much on actual individual game mechanics. Mostly what I'm going to be doing is giving advice about the philosophy and the ideas that go into building monsters and using them uh, in your game. So let's uh, let's start out. The first thing you want to do is, is plan your fights, the fights that you have with monsters. And you're going to want to look at your session and um, a monster fight is a great way to get the session rolling, to get it started. Um, and uh, so I oftentimes like to start my sessions off with a fight as quickly as possible. It gets the players fully engaged in the action and monsters make a perfect thing to put in this spot. If you've ever watched an action movie and it always starts off with some random scene with the hero defeating some non sequitur bad guy, same sort of concept. It's not an important character. We don't have to worry about the meat of the story yet. It's just a way to get our pulse up and get us engaged in the narrative. So a monster fight is a great way to kind of get things going. Um, but beyond that, Monster fights are a good way to show kind of progress uh, in the story, to give it beats and pauses. Um, you, can't, you can't have a whole dungeon adventure where it's just the entrance, uh, some traps, some narrative, and then the final villain. You need some monsters in there. That's the meat of the adventure. Um, and, you know, with, without a, a handful of monster fights, your entire plot line can feel flat. It can feel too short. The rewards they gain can feel kind of unearned. Now, from behind the screens, the trick here is understanding that you can um, use monster fights to kind of build up your treasure budget for later so that at the end, it's a real big payoff. It seems like they really got a lot out of that last fight, but really what they've done is fought a whole bunch of fights where you're not giving them as much treasure. That's what monster fights are great at, especially monsters where it doesn't make sense for them to have any treasure, right? You know, the, the, the random owlbear in the woods doesn't have a sack of gold on its belt. It doesn't even have a belt, <laughs> you know, so um, uh, but I, I think that's that's an important thing to understand that when you're looking at the texture of your story, sprinkling in monster fights is kind of how you form the basis without a bunch of monster fights. You don't have um, the baseline of a story to work with. So I, I think, you know, that's that's the kind of place where you start. Um, is you're, you're, you're picking your spots where you want to put in monster fights. You're figuring out where they fit in the narrative. Um, and you understand that they form kind of your baseline of the story. They're repetitive sometimes. They can be the thing that gives the narrative its, its texture. It's like, oh, it's that dungeon with the kobolds. Well, if it's that dungeon with the kobolds, you're going to fight a lot of kobolds in that dungeon. Um, 
But it's also important to note that monsters aren't all fights, right? Um, some monsters can be sympathetic in what they're doing, right? Um, you know, I, I, I think, uh, what was it? I was running uh, Oblivion Oath, and my players honestly felt bad about killing that owlbear in the woods uh, because they soon realized that it was just providing food for its young. And then they ended up with a baby owlbear cub that needed care and protection. Um, you know, monsters can surrender. Um, if, certainly, if they uh, have uh, any amount of intelligence, they can give up in the middle of a fight and, and, and plead for their lives. Um, they can even, in that way, become NPCs or maybe even allies. But you can't use this sparingly. Monsters, their fundamental function in the game is to provide fights that you can just have that are easy to kind of insert. And that's a spot where, you know, you as a GM have to be careful about what message you're sending with these kind of mindless monster fights. It's one thing to be like, there are a bunch of, you know, um, angry, you know, wolves that come out of the, the forest and attack. There are some skeletons that rise out of the dungeon and attack. You can, you can just have a fight with them without having any thought about, you know, what the ramifications and what message you're trying to send. Uh, in most cases. But that's not always true with some things that are traditionally classified as monsters. You can't do that with orcs. That's not appropriate. You can't do that with goblins, right? They are living, breathing, sentient creatures, and they require a bit more care than that. But all things being equal, monster fights uh, from a game meta perspective are really kind of there to form the texture of the, the plot. They're the baseline challenge. So, uh, you know, that, that's the first thing you need to do is you need to plan for your monster fights. So let's uh, let's recap that. It's a, it's a relatively short point, but it is worth noting. Um, you want to start your sessions off with a fight if you can. You want to use monster battles to show progress in the story and the narrative. Um, you want to, you know, remember that monsters can add uh, to an adventure's weight, to its, to its heft. Uh, the more monster fights they have, the longer it is, the more meaty it is, the more the final accomplishment feels like something that was earned. Uh, and monsters uh, don't have to be fights. They can be sympathetic foes, they can surrender or flee, they can even become allies. So, uh, you know, the, the, a lot of things to think about when you're planning your monster fights in your game. I'm gonna, these first uh, two points are a little bit thinner than the final point, uh, just because I do want to spend more time making monsters, but it's important to think about what you're using the monsters for before you start making them. So the, the next point uh, we're gonna we're gonna move on to here is uh, about picking uh, a monster. Uh, and what I mean by this is you've, you've decided where this monster fight lives in your story. It might be at the beginning, it might be in the middle, it might even be the end. It could be the cliffhanger monster fight. And um, deciding what monster to use uh, can be a, a, a big challenge in and of itself, right? Um, so, you know, do you use an existing monster? Maybe. Do you alter an existing monster? You take a monster and make it kind of different. You might, you might go that route. Or do you make something entirely brand new? Deciding which way to go is kind of your next step because you don't you don't want to spend the time making a monster that you don't need. So you need to kind of analyze um, which one is important for you. Um, so I, I honestly think uh, a good GM will mix up their choices, especially depending on the story that they're trying to tell. Um, it helps an awful lot to use recognizable monsters as the base. They form kind of the basic fantasy texture of the world. Now, your world might be different than this, and, and I'll, I'll touch on that here in just a bit, but all things being equal, if your world is kind of the standard fantasy world um, that is assumed by, you know, games like Pathfinder and D&D, &D, um, you know, using existing monsters to form kind of the base is really important. It may seem easy, simple. You might even feel like you're cheating a bit. That's okay. Trust me. The amount of work you have to do to add entirely new monsters to the game uh, is going to make it so that you're going to want to use a lot of these baseline monsters as often as possible. They kind of create that base fabric. That way, when you do introduce a unique monster or a changed monster or a reskinned monster, those monsters really stick out and you want them to as, as a GM. You want the things that they've never encountered before or have no experience with to really pop 
because those that's a way for you to form incredibly memorable uh, encounters. Um, now, like I said, you might have a world where, you know, uh, the, the players just arrived in this strange valley and no one knows what's in it and all the monsters are supposed to be strange and unusual. In that setting, you might want to make up more monsters than normal. Or you might want to reskin a bunch of those monsters so that they're not as obvious uh, uh, being what they are so that you keep your players guessing. Um, the choice of what monster you use says an awful lot about the world itself. And it's at this point where you're picking monsters for a fight where deciding on which monster you're going to use, uh, you know, or, or, or what monsters live in what places um, can really say a lot about the world and the narrative that you're trying to tell. Um, let's say, you know, you, you've got uh, adventurers traveling through uh, an area of the, the you know, the, the queen's protectorate and her guards are everywhere and uh, it's meant to be safe and there's farmers in their fields and whatnot. You can still have monster fights there, but they should definitely be random beasts that broke into the area or burrowed up from below or, you know, appeared randomly. They, they, they shouldn't be giant organized lots of bad guys right? Because that's not the story you're trying to tell. That's not the narrative you're trying to tell. It's a really obvious example, but there are far less obvious ways that you can get across the point of the world through the monsters that live in an area. And picking the right ones is, is, is your key to doing that. So if you have an area of your world that's truly wildlands and it's uh, a place that's been subject to the depredations of a dragon for centuries, you know, there's not going to be a lot of sheep and goats and kind of easy to feast upon animals in this area. The dragon's eaten them all. So, you know, you're going to want to pick different kinds of animals that speak to that. Maybe there are other dragon kin, but maybe there are other things that the dragon just can't eat as easily or doesn't like as its food source. Your choices here matter. It doesn't mean you can't just throw a random manticore at the players if you want. I mean, you can. Of course you can. But the how you utilize your monsters is really kind of one of the most useful tools uh, in your in your box for kind of describing the world at large. And it's, it's important to note that monsters can be used to define the map and the, the, the game space just as much as, as, as any mountain or lake or, or river ever could. Um, right? You know, if, if you put a, a giant group of, or a, a giant, a very large tribe of giants in the mountains nearby, um, those mountains are now beyond impassable. They're, they're impossible for low level players to go through. Um, and you know, if they want to make it to the city on the other side, now they have to make difficult choices. Right. And, and that's interesting and how you use that, uh, and how you, how you play with that is, is fun. Uh, as GM, I will oftentimes take my maps and kind of draw zones where various monsters live, just so that I have a better understanding and a record of where I think I want those things to be. I might move them over time, they might shift and change, but it is a way, um, you know, for me as a GM to understand kind of the zones of play, where I expect the players to go and what I expect them to face as they do it. Then, if you give them plenty of forewarning, yeah, those mountains are filled with uh, giants and they're third level and they decide to try and go through there, well, they've taken their life into their own hands. And, and you know, maybe in that case, they, they, they do deserve to have some boulders thrown at them until they get the point, which usually is going to be pretty quick. So, step two uh, is, uh, you know, picking, picking your monsters, you know, deciding what kind of monsters you need for your game. And... Uh, you know, should you use existing monsters, modify a classic, or create a new monster? That's kind of the first question you need to, to answer. Um, you're going to want to mix up your choices based on the needs uh, of the story and use existing monsters to form the fabric of your world. You want to use you mo new monsters to illuminate the world and showcase various elements that make sense to you. But your choice of monsters can say a lot about the world and the story, picking the right monsters for the right area will really help uh, stress and empathize the, the story uh, that uh, you're trying to, to tell. And uh, remember that monsters 
can define a landscape just as much as, uh, as any river or lake or mountain ever could. Ooh. <sighs> Stifling a sneeze. All right. Um, so let's move on to the meat. Let's move on to the, the bigger, the bigger piece of this particular story, making monsters. And I want to stop uh, for a moment and uh, I, I want to talk a little bit uh, first before we dive into the kind of nitty gritty of making monsters is that these same thoughts about how to make a monster can also be used to reskin a monster. One of the one of the most valuable tricks uh, in a GM's uh, toolkit that you can learn to master is that if you take a monster, change its description, you can basically steal its stats, its abilities, everything it does, and use them for something else. It's a great way to kind of make something on the fly that you need to tell the story you're trying to tell. I have used stat blocks for monsters to kit bash other monsters more times than I can tell. And fundamentally, all of the tools and tricks you use for making a monster from scratch are some of the same tools that you use to kit bash and modify a monster to make them make sense. Um, so we'll, we'll go through those, and then uh, at the end I'll, I'll come back to this topic and we'll talk a bit about kit bashing monsters. So let's talk about making monsters and making fun and exciting monsters. Um, creating a monster, you know, I mean, obviously it starts off with, you know, forming an idea about what, what, what the monster is and what you want the monster to do. But, but making a monster involves a lot more than just determining its statistics. Um, the first thing you want to do when building a new monster for your game is determining um, what the monster needs to be for the game to work. What, what, what does the game need out of the monster, right? Um, don't start with the world. Start with where, where, what does my game need out of this monster? What is its purpose? Is it a recurring monster? Is this the, the point of a, there's some new beast that has arrived that the players have to go deal with? Is it a unique creation? Is it something that someone built or, or made to menace this area? Is it, um, is it meant to be a, a weird uh, mutation of an existing monster? So maybe it's similar to, to an existing monster. What, what about the monster is going to illustrate something interesting about the story you're trying to tell? And all of this comes around to saying, you know, uh, can this spot be filled by an existing creature? Because that's the, that's the question. You, you need a solid answer to this question. Uh, otherwise, you should probably just use an existing creature, right? If, if it's just, I need a monster that lives in the woods that's going to menace the party when they're on their journey from town A to town B... Well, the books are filled with those sorts of monsters. There's not really much of a need to create a brand new monster for a random encounter, unless that encounter really isn't kind of random and you're trying to illustrate that something has broke loose from a nearby laboratory. That would make sense. In fact, if you stick to your guns on that and every time they travel between towns, when they run into a random encounter, it's a wolf or a bear or a you know, a, a, a manticore or something straightforward, that time where they travel from town to town and run into the strange, you know, bone amalgam that, you know, that that's a thing that they're going to go, wait, there's something really weird going on here. Normally, we, we run into wolves and bears and stuff, and that thing's weird. Where did that come from? That alone will uh, drive your narrative uh, forward. So what do you what do you need the monster for? So once you have your answer to that question, I need it for this part of the story, I need it for this villain, I need it to to illustrate how bad this villain is. The next thing you want to look at is what is the monster's purpose in the world specifically? Not in the story, but in the world itself. What's its niche? Where does it live? What does it eat? Uh, where does it lair? Does it care about treasure? How does it how does it behave? How do other creatures react to it? Does it get along with other creatures? Does it not get along with other creatures? Like, 
is this creature the servitor creature of another creature? Like one thing that I enjoy doing is taking uh, a well-known, uh, uh, you know, a group of creatures, like say goblins or fire giants or something like that. And if I build the new creature, I'm going to build a creature that they have domesticated. You know, oh, the fire giants have domesticated these these flame wolves. Sure, yeah, that'd be great. That'd be a lot of fun. Um, I already know what they're there for. It's a way to mix up the fight with the fire giants. Um, I don't have to spend too much uh, building a deep niche for a creature that is adjacent to a creature that already has a niche. Well, lots of things you can do with that. But you know, that that's a that's a those questions are one you're going to want to ask about anything you make, right? Oh, I've decided I'm going to make a new, uh, you know, uh, uh, mountainous. Uh, uh, statue creature that is uh it is 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 related to gargoyles i want to make another gargoyle analog right um you know you have to ask yourself what how do i make this creature different from existing creatures right so oh i want another mountainous creature that pretends to be statues well you know gargoyles already kind of do that so you got to really kind of push your envelope in different ways right oh no this creature actually specifically pretends to be the statue of deities and has this thing against uh, clerics and uh, likes to wait until they come and pray to it and it siphons their divine prayers out of them awesome i don't know what it is but it's now not a gargoyle right i know where it layers i know what it eats i've, I've, I've started answering some of those questions right and, and that's what you kind of want you, you want to be able to do as you build your monster. You want to say, what do I need it for in the game? So I'm telling a story about clerics that are find as, found as desiccated husks inside their shrines. Is it a vampire? Is it some sort of horrible thing? No, no, it's this weird statue creature that uh, likes to siphon away their prayers. That's fun. Um, you know, so I know what it, I need it for the story because it's the villain that's killing people. I now know what it's, uh, ecological niche is, um, um, for example, um, you know, I'm, I'm starting to, to check out boxes and the next box you want to check out is how does it fight? <laughs> what does it do in combat that makes it interesting and dynamic? This is something this is something that we in particular took to heart with Pathfinder 2nd edition. There were a lot of monsters in 1st edition and some earlier versions of the game where they're just a bag of hit points and they just run up and attack you. And that that's what they do. That's their entire purpose. They don't have any special abilities. They don't have anything cool about them. They just run up and attack. And I'm not saying the game doesn't need some of those, but the game already has a fair number of those. So if you're going to be making more of those, you better be asking yourself some very serious questions about what makes it interesting and worth the time and energy it takes to build a monster. So, you know, asking yourself, what does it do in combat that makes it interesting and unique? I'm not saying you're building mechanics right now. You're just imagining what it is you think it should do. Put yourself in the role of the GM, describing it, taking its action in combat. Use that that thought process to help develop. This is what I want this monster to do. This is what uh, kind of cool, crazy thing it should do in the middle of a fight. Expand beyond that. Think about what it does outside of combat uh, that can serve it to make it an interesting part of the narrative. Don't just think about your monster in terms of what it can do in combat. Think about it in terms of what other things can it do that aren't in combat that make it interesting. Oh, I've got this weird statue creature that drains out divine energy. Well, that's not actually happening during combat. That's an ability that it doesn't use in combat. It's an ability it uses while someone is making their daily preparations in front of it. Interesting. Now, once you have those things, does that ability have a side effect or something related to it that it could use in combat? Maybe if you cast a divine spell near it, it can siphon off some of the energy. All of the all of the DCs are lower and the durations are halved. Maybe that's what it does. That's interesting. Related to its main ability, related to its story, related to its purpose in the game. All of it starts playing together. You'll notice all of these things start locking into place. And all of this should ultimately speak to its statistics. And depending on what game system you're using, building the statistics for a monster can be 
Complex can be simple. I'm not really going to delve too much into building statistics. The game engines themselves cover that. Um, and although I could certainly do something about effectively building statistics for the various game systems, we'll save that for another time. Um, what I'm going to say right now is you should use those rules to make it emblematic of its role and purpose. All the things you've thought about up to this point. Well, I've decided this creature that we are building is a stone statue and it drains divine magic. Okay, cool. When I'm building its statistics, I should keep those things in mind. Well, it's made of stone. That means it should be not incredibly agile, should be relatively strong. I mean, its AC probably isn't going to be too great, but depending on the system you're using, it could have something like hardness or something like that that reduces its damage because it's like a statue. should be durable, but maybe not hard to hit. Maybe when it does attack itself, it hits like a like a you know a freight train, right? Because it is a statue. Um, maybe that's its primary mode of attack in combat. You know, other than draining away divine spells, um, maybe it doesn't need anything else beyond that. But all of this should be pointing you towards the direction of the thing that is arguably the most precious real estate that you have, uh, and that is its abilities. Statistics are good. Armor class, saving throws, attack rolls. All of those are important. I'm not. I don't want to. I don't want to pretend that they're not because they are critically important to making a monster a success. But the most important things that you will build in a monster are its special abilities. And when I say these are precious, they're they're not just precious in terms of like your word count or making a monster that's too long. Right, I, I tend to think about how I make monsters to print them in a game, in a book. But there, there's another aspect of that as well, and that's the amount of things they can do in a fight. Uh, whenever I look at a monster, I can always tell whether or not the person who designed it is uh, is kind of an old hand at this or relatively new. Some monsters will have, you know, 12 different things it can do. Let's see if we're going to get to do all of those things. You've, you've built it twice as many things um, than, than it could ever possibly do in the middle of a fight, right? So you've, you've, you've spent too much effort building things that'll never see the table, at least not in an individual fight. It's better to focus on the things that you know you're going to get use out of that are going to make for a fun routine, a, a fun series of attacks. And you want to you want to you want to utilize those as hard as you can, and not just build extra and extra and extra and extra and extra. Monsters, generally speaking, are only on the uh, the battlefield for what three, four, five rounds tops. If it has twelve rounds worth of things it can do, well, half of those are never going to see play. So it's better to focus on on kind of the more signature things. That doesn't mean you should cut out all the things that aren't inherently super useful or. You should cut out the things that are story valuable. I think you can compartmentalize those things and say this is more of a story ability. That's something that's going to use outside of combat. These are other abilities it's going to use in the middle of a fight. And understand that those have different purposes and include both. But if you're purely looking at combat abilities, you should probably limit yourself to, eh, you know, three or four tops. You know, the moment you start breaking past that, you've kind of built too many. And there's a decent chance you'll never get a chance to use them. And this, all of this, leads to the most uh, kind of important point that I can uh, that I can give you. Um, my secret for making a fun monster: uh, a monster's uh, abilities should be surprising. The players should uh, honestly be like, "Oh no!" when an ability hits the table, right? Uh, but upon reflection, when they think back to the monster, the ability should be something that everyone expected, right? Uh, let me explain. So um, if you're fighting the, uh, uh, you know, a, an owlbear, let's just say, in, in, you know, an owlbear in second edition, and the owlbear uh, knocks you to the ground and starts ripping out your guts you're going to be very surprised by that um it uh it is uh it's it's really gonna 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 tear into you and uh you're you're gonna be like oh my god i am taking a whole bunch of damage as it just kind of eviscerates me but afterwards you're gonna go 
Well, it is an owl, and it's probably ripping out my guts so I can take it back to its young and feed. So my point is, this kind of nuanced thing to get across, is that um, the abilities should be something that makes sense for the story and the narrative that you've built up for the monster. But they shouldn't be necessarily rote or routine. So having abilities on a monster that are, are shocking and new is always a lot of fun. I, I, I take joy in building those things. Um, one thing that I think I cut from like uh, the version of the Adiog that I wrote was it had an ability to rush at you in the sewer and cause a tidal wave of sewer water to wash up over you and knock you to the ground and cover you in gross sewer water. I think I got cut for space, but that's the sort of ability I'm thinking about. When it happens, you're like, oh, that really sucks. And you want your players to have that cognitive moment where they go, and we totally should have expected that it would do something like that because it makes sense for its story. It makes sense for the, the setting that it's in. Everything about it clicks and pops. It feels natural. Nobody likes a monster who has a bunch of gotcha abilities. You know, there are abilities that just screw you over and you... They weren't telegraphed in any way. There's nothing about the monster that made you expect that special ability was about to come out of the woodwork and screw you over. Um, you know, but those sorts of abilities can be really key if they are revealed, if they are part of the story and the narrative it's like uh it's like when a a, a a hydra for the first time that you ever face one when a hydra's heads go darting out in every direction and bite everyone within range and everybody gets bit at once why because it's a hydra it's covered in heads that's something that makes sense for something it could do great yeah so um, those abilities, uh, to, to sum it up, those abilities should, you know, uh, resonate with everything else you have determined. So let's let's sum up uh, making uh, fun-filled monsters here. What, what does the game need from the monster? Is it a recurring threat? Is it a unique creature? Is it central to the plot? You need to think about that. Can... That role be filled by an existing creature. Is there something about the idea for the creature that makes it unique uh, to the game rules that it doesn't exist yet? And if you can't, if you can't answer that question, you should probably stick with an existing monster. And uh, you know, beyond that, what's its ecology? What does it eat? Where does it live? How does it? How does it? How does it reproduce? Um, all of these things are things that you should understand. What does it do in a fight? How does it attack? How is that interesting and dynamic? Um, and how do you use that knowledge to build its statistics? Uh, and once you're in the statistics, those are really important. How do you use all those narrative pieces to make the statistics, ah, the statistics uh, interesting and informative? Um, of what it can be. And finally, uh, how do you make its abilities uh, uh, a critical part of it? Don't build too many. Uh, you know, put in the ones you need. And the, remember that the abilities should be both surprising and expected. That is, that is the trick with building fun monster abilities, is getting across the point of their story and narrative uh, and uh, to the point where when they use a special ability on the players, um, everyone's surprised by it, but they also are, it makes sense for the monster. It's a, it, it seems like an obvious bit of, 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 of monster building, but you'd be surprised how often it just doesn't come across. So I said I, want, I was going to talk a little bit about um, uh, reskinning a monster, and I want to do that as kind of an addendum to this discussion. Um, because reskinning a monster is a special skill. Uh, I think, you know, you all have monster books that are filled with monster statistics. These monsters already have special abilities, but it's real easy to take an existing monster stat block with its existing abilities and reskin it into the monster you need it to be. So, um, you know, let's say you want a, uh, a, a vicious... Uh, nasty 
sewer eel, you know, like a, like a two-headed sewer eel. And you don't know, you know, how you're going to build it. You don't have a lot of time. And you're looking for something to reskin uh, to make this sewer eel. And, and you're, you're not really being too particular about what it can do. It just needs to be nasty and uh, needs to be uh, powerful. And you're, you're flipping through the book and you know you want it to be like around level five or so or something like that. You know, you could just grab like the troll. Right? Oh, it has regeneration. Well, the sewer eel could have regeneration. Um, oh, the troll has rend. Oh, well, I'll just say if it hits you with two, both of its heads, uh, it can rend your flesh and rip you, uh, you know, limb from limb. Mostly, the rest of the stats are going to work just fine. Now, the, 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 uh, the troll has uh, regeneration that's shut down by fire or acid, and maybe that doesn't make sense for your sewer eel. Maybe its regeneration is shut down by electricity or something like that. And you could telegraph that uh, in various ways because whenever it thunders and lightning, these things retreat back into the sewer. And, you know, it's not a perfect match, but if you're a GM in a pinch and you need a monster for right now, that is always a great way to do it. Grab a monster that's roughly the right level, adjust and kit bash its statistics until they are what you need them to be. And all of the previous things apply, they just apply in a much quicker way. And you instead of using them to find new abilities for a monster to do, what you're doing instead is using all of those guides about what you need the monster to be, what, the, what abilities it needs to have, what statistics inform its place in the world and you're using those to narrow down the monsters in the books that you already have to determine which one has the stats and abilities close enough to the story piece that you want right so if you're thinking about all the various monsters that are level nine but you know uh you know this thing needs to be a bruiser and a brute you're going to want to look at giants right you know you're going to want to shift over to those and stay away from like undead and probably outsiders because they're not going to have the abilities you want you're going to want a, a monster with a lower ac a lot of hit points that hits really hard great look at giants that's a good place to go right you can grab those statistics trim off abilities add others oh i don't need this thing to have immunity to fire i grab the fire giant stat block i can strip away its immunity to fire and instead you know this is some you know i don't know charging ice whale and now it has immunity to cold and a, a trample ability and you can just add these things together to make the monsters you need i i think in Pathfinder, we do that by having universal monster rules be easily plug and playable monster components that you can just take off and add on to make the monster you want. I think that's kind of your easiest way to, to do that is, is use the rules for making monsters to trim away the ones that you don't need until you find the one that's close enough. Peel off any abilities you don't want, add the few that you do. I would say, though, that it's important to note as GM that... Uh, Using this ability to reskin a monster is usually my tool of last resort or my tool of improv at the table. Um, I generally don't do it in advance, and I certainly don't do it if it's a monster that I know needs to be a feature monster for the adventure that I'm, I'm building. I'm not saying you can't start there. You certainly can. In fact, the easiest way to kind of build a cogent monster quickly is to follow that pattern. But usually if I'm doing something that's going to be a feature for an entire adventure... I'm going to want to build it from scratch and build it whole. That's my preference. Might not be yours. Um, maybe you've got a different way of doing it. Leave me leave me a, a, a note in the comments. Um, but for me anyway, whenever I'm uh, building an adventure where the monster is going to be a feature, um, I'm generally going to build that one from scratch. So I think that about sums up everything I have for this lecture. In some of my previous lectures, I've gone straight into the Q&A, but I think I'm going to reserve the Q&A now for the Twitch only. So for those of you who have watched that in the past, if you want to take part in the Q&A that follows these lectures, make sure to come by my Twitch channel, um, which you can find at twitch.tv backslash Jason Bullman, and you can take part in the uh, Q&A. These uh, lectures happen starting at 4 p.m. Uh, every uh, Saturday. They run for about an hour. The Q&A follows up directly after that. 
that. And if you want to take part, make sure to stop by. For the rest of you, uh, thank you for watching. You can find me uh, here uh, on uh, YouTube at youtube.com uh, backslash Jason Bullman. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, all that. Uh, same, same kind of place. There'll be links down below. Uh, make sure to like and subscribe if you want to see more content like this. And I want to thank you all for watching. And we will see you next time.